Thank you, Kate, for that kind introduction. Uh, so Kate told you a little bit about Periscopic, and what we do is not only to uh, make data pretty, but also make it digestible to allow people to have insights about data. So when we think about data literacy, we think about uh, Francis Curcio's three-part definition, which is uh, reading the data, so meaning understanding the values, reading between the data, or making comparisons, and this is not working. Okay, and reading beyond the data, which means uh, being able to make predictions or inferences based on that data. But we really don't know much about data literacy, and that is, that's the truth about data literacy. We don't know a lot. There have been some graph comprehension studies, but they deal really with a lot of rudimentary things like the differences between bar charts versus pie charts and 2D versus 3D, and can we distinguish the, or is one better than the other? Uh, but the studies really can't keep up with the explosion of experimental and exploratory visualizations that people are doing these days. But the one thing we know is that data illiteracy is created and propagated by us. So we have control over data literacy. But this is a recent problem. I think there was a time when people didn't get such a knot in their, in their knickers about whether people could understand visualizations or not. There was a time, uh, the, the history of visualization goes back to roughly the 14th century, uh, but there was a, a time when there was really the golden age from like the mid 1700s to 1900s where a lot of really cool things were produced. A lot of people were doing interesting things. And then something interesting happened very recently. People started assessing the efficacy of graphs and charts. They started cataloging the best practices or the right way to do things. So we had this long, rich tradition of building from intuition, the people on the, on the left side, and then on the right side you have the critics. They came, they came in and started taking over. Or as I like to call them, the doers versus the donters. And it's not that the donters don't produce things. Many of them have had great contributions to the field. It's just that they started taking a critical look at what people were producing. So sure, we need these critics to help us, you know, make sure that our axes are labeled correctly and make sure all our numbers are going the right direction. But what we really need to do is to start lifting people up to data literacy. So the first part of that is really to realize that we're all fallible creatures on both sides of the fence, both as creators and viewers. And now we all know that our own biases can inform how we create things and how our work is perceived, but we often forget about the viewer's biases. But it's quite possibly the most important factor when thinking about people reading charts and graphs is bias. Uh, people will look for evidence of their own beliefs, and that's called confirmation bias. This is a table from a study done by Cornell that they did about income inequality, or equality as they like to call it, in, in the US. And it starts on the left side with the actual income growth. And you can see that a large part of the US is in pretty dismal shape. And as you go along for, through each of the columns towards the right, they started adding non-cash benefits like uh, food stamps, other social programs, tax credits, that sort of thing, until this number started looking pretty good. In the, in the far most right column, they even went so far as to include health insurance as income. So who, who would consider health insurance income? I, don't, I personally don't consider health insurance something that's income. I can't buy a loaf of bread with health insurance. Uh, but, but apparently they considered that, um, that income. And I'll, you know, most people here under universal coverage, they're looking at me doe-eyed, what are you talking about? That's all right. We'll, we'll get to your utopia eventually. We're, we're headed there. <laughs> so, uh, but conservatives, looking for a quick hit on their beliefs, 
go right to the right column and say, hey, wow, things are, are going really well. I'm going to do a story about that. That's fantastic. I don't know what these naysayers are doing. But liberals will look and say, you know, hold up, that doesn't look quite right to me. So they'll start at the left and say, you know, this looks more like reality to me, these numbers. And then they can go column by column and figure out that, you know, they did a lot of sneaky things to really make these, these numbers look like they were comparable or that they were real. And I did a quick comp of this in Tableau. So you could see I, I compared the left column to the right column. And you could see they really turned that frown upside down. They made that look pretty good. So, but the point is, we're all looking at the same data, but our biases are keeping us from seeing the same results. Another part of bias is about the messenger, who is bringing us this information. Uh, William Playfair was considered by many to be the father of modern visualization. He created the pie chart, the area chart, lots of things we find commonplace today. But uh, his charts were largely dismissed by those who knew him. He was a rather unscrupulous character. He uh, tried to patent many other people's inventions as his own. He even later tried his hand at blackmail. <laughs> He was an opportunist whose reputation really colored the way people saw his work. England was not very impressed by him, by his work after that, you know, they, they knew him very well. But after he moved to France a few years later, where not many people knew of him personally, he actually found that his work was widely accepted there. And even the king uh, extolled his charts and graphs. Uh, Florence Nightingale was seen as a bit of a rabble rouser. She was born into privilege and used some of her connections to further her ideas about sanitation. She even had to leak her own rose diagram, the, the diagram we know so well, because no one wanted to publish it, even though it, it, it agreed with their findings about sanitation. She was seen as a sort of a, of a pit bull, and it took a long time for people to really accept her work. So viewers can often let their uh, their views of a negative trait about a person uh, permeate to the visualization. And I know that the reverse halo effect is true and real because anytime I see a Fox News chart, I immediately start dissecting it. I know there's something wrong. There's something wrong with it. <laughs> Even if Fox News created a graph that supported my belief that climate change is real, that humans created it, and that we're all responsible, even if they created that chart and put it out there, I would still try to pick it apart. I would still be suspicious about it. So you know, this is different than confirmation bias. I'm not looking for something that supports my own views. I know that Fox News is wrong, and they'll always be wrong. <laughs> so, so it just goes to prove how far our own minds will go to subvert data. So back to the point about lifting people to data literacy. People often think the solution to illiteracy is to make things simpler. People will advise you to use bar charts or line charts because everybody knows them and understands them, right? Stephen Few would love me to get up here and tell you to use bar charts for everything. But I think it's quite the contrary. I think people will catch up. People will catch up to our visualizations. I have a baby at home. He doesn't know how to talk yet. Does that mean I shouldn't talk to him? Of course not. That would be horrible. Poor little guy. Uh, he learns through my speaking to him. Right? Steve Jobs didn't say, we're not going to do the pinch gesture because nobody knows it. And now we're pinching everything. Right? I try to pinch my ATM balance. Right? <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> People have an uncanny ability to live up or down to our estimation of them. This is a visual from one project we recently created for the Hewlett Foundation. It shows the distribution of the grants that they've given out uh, over their program areas. And when we did user testing on this, 70% of the people got all the tasks absolutely correct. And another 20% got very, very close. 
that's a very high success rate. Although those same people said, we weren't very sure. I wasn't sure about my answer. I didn't feel confident about it. I spent some time, I double checked to make sure I was right. So that, that to me, there's a big gap there. So we need to start making more confident chart readers. If your work is interactive, help the user out by uh, you know, giving them positive reinforcement through rollovers, through tooltips, things like that. Uh, simply reinforce what they're seeing. Highlight the numbers they're selecting. Uh, they need to feel validated. So sometimes all it takes is mirroring what they're doing to show them that. You have the computer on your side. If you know that there's something important to look at, compute it and show it to people. This is part of a project that we are doing for about salmon. And it's the chart at the top is a temperature chart showing ranges of, of safe level to lethal zone. And it's historic. And then along the bottom, you could see the um, migrational runs of the different salmon species. So that's all nice and well. That's great. But we, you know, it took us a minute to realize that you know, we can actually compute some things for the users and show. We can show the intersection of when fish are actually in these dangerous waters, right? So this is, you know, three months where these different species are in, literally, in hot water. That equals dead fish. People can see that very easily. So a good visualization is like a fine piece of prose. It's elegant and succinct, but there's still enough there to have a lot of rich character. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about this culture of data we're creating. I think that we're creating a culture of data fear. We're making people believe that big data is hiding under their bed, waiting to pounce on them when they wake up. Now, I realize that most of you here think that you, know, you see big data as big opportunity, and that's true. But for the masses, they see it as data terrorism, right? Just like you know, all the computers were going to steal our jobs back in the 80s, it's the same thing. I don't know if you all remember that. I see some young people here. <laughs> but uh, it's the same thing with data. Data's going to come steal our souls. They're going to start sending us coupons for diapers before we know we're pregnant and do all these horrible things to us, right? It's just it's terrifying to people. Even well-intentioned people do this. Uh, Clay Johnson, who I, I love, I love the work he's done, uh, he has a very popular book out right now called The Information Diet, which I think is fantastic, but it does have one error in it. It says that US, the U.S. consumes 3.6 zettabytes of data per day. per day. I don't think that's even humanly possible. We would have to be constantly have things sucking into our brain. It's, it's not possible. That's actually the number per year, right? The actual number is per person is actually about 34 gigs per day. Now, 34 gigs may seem like a lot to some people, but really, you know, it's not that much. About an hour's worth of TV is about a gig's worth of data, so it's not horrible. You know, I want to show you something here. If I can get this clicker to go. Aw, cute, right? <laughs> Adorable, Oh, so sweet. Right there, 10 megabytes of data. You all just consume 10 megabytes. <laughs> okay. Did you survive that data deluge? Uh, you know, this isn't a horrible thing, right? <laughs> the age of data, we often refer to it as a tsunami or a deluge, a flood. Things that can have frightening and devastating effects. This is scaring people. So what does that have to do with data literacy? Anytime there is a culture of fear, rational thought is abandoned and aversion is, ensues. Nobody is going to want to consume data, let alone understand it, if we keep overwhelming them with these huge numbers. So back to the history lesson. Playfair was the first to develop many of our modern uh, statistical graphs, and all without the help of critics. He just showed us what, how he was seeing the data in his head. right? It was very natural. However, it took almost a century for his work to be accepted. So should we start testing everything we do? Should we start you know, making sure that all the critics are, are checking us out? No, I don't 
personally believe so. Uh, you know, it's like the pinch gesture again. Nobody knew you could do it until somebody showed you how, right? And that's not a horrible thing. That's not a horrible barrier. People will learn the visualizations. And over time, the stream graph will become commonplace. Arc diagrams will be commonplace. Everything that we make will become commonplace, if it's good. Now, I hope that we have a quicker path to acceptance than poor William did. But the dirty truth about data literacy is also the beautiful truth about it. It's the fact that we create it. And just like Playfair and Nightingale and all the others before us, we're creating from intuition. We're building from this belief that we can show the intangible. And we just have to trust that we can lift our viewers into literacy. Thank you. <laughs>